the woman free from the man, both free from capital. Those words were uttered by the Italian communist uh, Camilla Rivera in 1921. And I think that sums up very well the Marxist position on the women's question, uh, which is as long as we have capitalism, uh, no oppression can be abolished within it. But what does this really mean? Um, for most feminists, um, this position has been interpreted as uh, since Marxist belief that women's oppression has a material basis within capitalism, cannot be abolished within it. Um, there's really no use fighting against it uh, because a socialist revolution will erupt automatically and solve it automatically. Uh, and the day after the revolution, women's oppression will disappear. Um, and if we struggle for any reforms, it's purely economical ones. Uh, Marxists are more or less blind to the cultural aspects of, of women's oppression or think it's uh, non-important uh, at all. Now, this view on the one hand um, is a view that many leftists have of Marxists on all positions, really. Uh, when Marxists say that we need a socialist revolution to, to solve anything, uh, they will think, aha, we don't need to struggle for any reforms. Uh, you just want to wait for a socialist revolution, uh, which will solve everything automatically. Um, and in this, uh, a socialist revolution is more or less portrayed as, as a train ride, uh, where you get on, you might have a little nap, you wake up, you get off at socialism, uh, and you find paradise. A revolution is not really like that. Um, but if that were true, uh, then political activity, uh, organizing, uh, party building, uh, would be completely unnecessary. Um, this meeting, this discussion, this whole uh, organization would be completely unnecessary. But uh, it's not really the case. But this view um, is also uh, the effect of the uh, betrayals of the labor movement, and in particular the distortion of Marxism by, by Stalinism, which I will uh, come back to later. Uh, now, is it possible for Marxists to ignore uh, the women's question, to ignore women's struggle? Is it possible for the working class uh, to take power without also struggling against women's oppression? It is not. Uh, and that is partly because uh, women's oppression uh, is a fundamental uh, part of capitalism, which means you cannot struggle <laughs> against capitalism and abolish it without also struggling against <coughs> women's oppression. But it is also because a majority of the world's poor, a big part of the working class, are women. Um, and the working class cannot take power without, uh, without women. And women uh, will not struggle um, without also struggling uh, against their specific oppression. Now, women's oppression is something that affects all aspects uh, of women's lives. Uh, violence causes more death uh, and disability worldwide amongst women aged uh, 15 to 44 than cancer, uh, war, malaria, um, and traffic accidents. At least one in three women uh, have been uh, beaten, coerced into sex, uh, or otherwise abused in their lifetime, with the abuser someone usually known to her. 99% of uh, maternal deaths uh, occur in developing countries um, and uh, women continue to die uh, of pregnancy related causes with a rate of one every minute. Um, and in Sweden, women make around 85% of men's income and this is supposed to be the most equal country in the world, or one of them. Um, and they spend um, around 30 hours a week uh, on, on household work, uh, where men spend uh, 20 hours every week. Uh, and in the ages 20 to 64, around 40% of women have full-time employments. Uh, and for men in the same category, it's, it's 80%. Uh, one woman is beaten to death every week um, 
by someone known to her. Um, and 700 women uh, get raped every uh, week. And out of those, only three lead to conviction. And in Pakistan, you need to have uh, four male witnesses when you get raped. Um, not just that can claim that the uh, rape has taken place, but who saw the actual penetration. Now, all of the aspects of women's oppression creates enormous sense of frustration amongst women, leading to suicide, uh, eating disorders, um, depression, all kinds of things. But also, uh, it leads to such frustration and anger, uh, which will turn sooner or later into struggle. And this means that working class women, uh, young women, uh, lower uh, parts of the middle class uh, women, um, they are an enormous source uh, of revolutionary potential, which has been shown time and time again uh, in revolutions, when women have played uh, a leading role, uh, often the first ones to move, uh, and almost always the last ones to give up, not because women are, are better um, or anything like that, but because women are uh, extremely oppressed in capitalism and have uh, more to lose uh, if a revolution fails and more to win if it, if it succeeds. Uh, Marxists do not disagree with feminists that there exists cultural aspects of uh, women's oppression. Uh, but we simply explain and understand how uh, and why it does exist and how to uh, abolish it. Uh, feminists, and in particular I would say uh, radical feminists, uh, they have contributed with a lot of good research uh, on how women's oppression works, uh, how it functions in society, um, and uh, have researched a lot of good statistics, which is obviously good, uh, which we can use as Marxists, uh, and it's good for anyone who wants to uh, fight women's oppression. And many of them have um, sacrificed a lot in the struggle uh, against women's oppression, uh, risked their lives uh, in that struggle. And most feminists are very, very angry young women who are very frustrated uh, about their situation in society. Um, but feminism, whether it is uh, queer feminism, um, radical feminism, intersectionality, uh, what is uh, called Marxist feminism, uh, cannot explain why women's oppression exists um, and how uh, it came to be and how to abolish it. And because uh, some people would say, well, okay, you need Marxism to explain some parts of it, um, but Marxism has some weaknesses, and this has been developed by uh, intersectionality and uh, other ideas in feminism, um, and also, therefore, you need to use these tools. Um, but that is false because all these uh, streams within, uh, within feminism uh, contradict the basic uh, ideas, the fundamental ideas of Marxism, all of those does. Queer feminism, radical feminism, contains basic ideas which contradict Marxism, and therefore it cannot be uh, a development of Marxism. Uh, now, Engels explained uh, in The Origins of the Family, Private Property and States that Women's oppression has not always uh, existed. Uh, majority of, uh, of human life, uh, we lived in what Marxists refer to as primitive communism, uh, without a state, without women's oppression, without class oppression, um, class society. Uh, we existed and uh, lived in equality, uh, where the lineage was uh, passed down through the mother, uh, group <coughs> marriages, were uh, the dominant form uh, of, of marriage. And women and men contributed equally uh, to the survival uh, of the clans. But what happened was uh, when herding uh, emerged and cultivation of the land uh, began, uh, a surplus started to arise. And some people were better uh, at farming, some people were better at herding, some people happened to have better land, and differences began to emerge, 
private property started to emerge. Um, and with these differences, women's oppression also started to emerge because these were things that were in the hands of men. Um, and therefore, from going uh, in, from societies, living societies, where men and women were contributing equally, uh, the clans started breaking up. Uh, classes started uh, to appear. Um, and with that, uh, women who were no longer contributing equally uh, were more or less enslaved uh, to, to men. Um, and because men wanted uh, to uh, have their children inherit their private property, uh, the lineage was shifted to men. Uh, and in order to make sure uh, that his children were really his children, uh, monogamy uh, started uh, to appear uh, as a way of making sure that uh, the children were really uh, the children of, of, of the man. Uh, and of course, the monogamous family has more or less always meant monogamy for uh, women, uh, but not for men. And so the majority since that time, uh, women have been more or less uh, isolated uh, in their homes um, and tied to their men, uh, more or less an appendage uh, of, of their men. Now, with capitalism, um, capitalism freed a large part of women, uh, pushed peasant women, uh, but also upper class women into production. Uh, and because of that, um, women can, uh, to a bigger extent during capitalism, because they are freed more so from the household work, they can uh, achieve um, a bigger part of relative freedom in comparison to during feudalism or, or slave society. But because capitalism still needs uh, the bourgeois family unit, it needs uh, a family unit in which uh, household work is done in order uh, to reproduce the working class, in order to make sure that new babies are born, uh, taken care of, so that new workers uh, arise that they can uh, exploit and oppress uh, viciously. Uh, because of that, uh, they still need uh, women's unpaid labor uh, in the household. Um, and are dependent on that, on the survival of, of capitalism. And th therefore, f women are never drawn into production as men uh, are, as, uh, to the same extent uh, as men are. Um, but women will also, uh, or the mi women's main role, uh, will always be uh, precisely the reproduction of the working class uh, and the unpaid labor in, in their household and therefore uh, can never be freed uh, from, from the men altogether during capitalism. Um, now, of course, uh, for a period, um, this household work has been partly socialized uh, by the creation of welfare state in the post-war period. Uh, but this was a very special period uh, in which the world market expanded enormously um, and because of this, uh, the capitalists could make huge profits uh, by uh, investing and reinvesting in production, expanding production. Uh, and because of that, they constantly needed new labor. Uh, and women were drawn into production uh, more and more. And because of that, there was a need for capitalism. Uh, for, for a welfare state, for a certain degree of socialization uh, of, of the household work. Um, but since the 70s, since the crisis on the, uh, in the 70s, and especially since the crisis which began in 2008, today, um, <coughs> capitalism no longer develops like this. Uh, it no longer creates huge profits mainly by expanding uh, production, rather the other way around. Uh, it, achieves it through squeezing the working class harder. And so it doesn't need more and more labor. Uh, rather, more and more people are pushed out of production. Um, and with this, uh, the burden on women uh, increases and the role of, uh, of the bourgeois family unit also increases. 
and not the other way around. In this crisis, they will attempt uh, to smash the welfare state in country after country. Um, the only way to do away uh, with the slavery of women, uh, the only way to, to do away the, with the bourgeois family unit, is to socialize uh, the household work. But the only way to do this uh, is to uh, get rid of capitalism, to nationalize uh, the economy, uh, the main levers of the economy, the big banks, uh, the big industries, and place them in the hands of the working class <coughs> who can democratically run it. Um, then, basically, uh, there's no limit to what we could do. We could reduce the working day to a minimum. We could give uh, universal free childcare uh, both night and day to all children, uh, create cheap public restaurants. There's no limit to what uh, we can do, which was shown uh, in the Russian Revolution, which precisely began to do that. But was uh, that process was cut off by, by Stalinism, the isolation of the revolution. Uh, because capitalism uh, is dependent on the existence of the bourgeois family unit, that also means that it has to suppress all those who pose a threat to that bourgeois uh, family unit, uh, which is gay people, uh, transgender, uh, intersexual, um, all those who don't want to define uh, their gender, uh, all those with uh, divergent sexual practices uh, pose such a threat. And many of them have experienced increased oppression uh, since the development of capitalism. Uh, now, how do the ideas, the cultural uh, aspects, uh, if you so will, of, of women's oppression, uh, the gender roles uh, which uh, feminists refer to, how do they uh, arise? How are they connected uh, to, to the material basis? Uh, well, Marxists are uh, materialists. And what this means is that we explain that the ideas uh, in society, uh, the norms um, in society, are a reflection of how society is organized. It's a reflection of uh, the reality we live in, in which the mode of production uh, lays the basis for, for how society is organized. Uh, and the mode of production of, of material lies, uh, lays the condition for, for all the development of of intellectual life, of philosophy, uh, and so on. And this doesn't mean that it's uh, mechanical, where the um, uh, mode of production, where the economic uh, factors is a constant active factor. We can go and look for every uh, single aspect uh, of life, uh, where you can see, oh, this is related to the economy in this way, uh, where every single thought uh, in a human's brain is directly related to uh, the economic causes uh, in society. Uh, but uh, it lays the general foundation uh, for the development of, of uh, the ideas in society, and it sets certain limits. Um, now, the dominant ideas uh, in a class society is always the ideas of the ruling class, uh, which is, during capitalism, the dominant ideas in society is the ideas of the bourgeoisie. And again, this is not mechanical, where uh, all women have to confide to this one idea and actually do that. There are many ideas on how women should act, uh, often contradicting ones, um, and are, of course, different in different countries. But there are ideas uh, that exist, which all uh, meet uh, and have to adapt to um, or uh, feel the pressure of uh, adapting uh, to, which causes a lot of frustration. Now, the ideas of how women should act uh, is a reflection of how we live and how we have lived for thousands of years. Uh, the idea that women belong in the kitchen is precisely because uh, for thousands of years she did. She was in the kitchen, and in, in capitalism, she still, to a very large extent, does. Uh, the idea is that women are stupid or uh, don't <coughs> understand philosophy, don't understand politics, uh, don't belong in higher education, is precisely because for thousands of years she didn't. She was excluded from all of that. Uh, 
she shouldn't understand any of it. It's irrelevant to, to women. Um, and sexual violence uh, is a consequence of uh, women's subordination to men, um, where men are taught uh, to uh, control uh, their women um, and to suppress their women, uh, which in some cases leads to domestic violence uh, and rape. Um, and in some senses, of course, people would say, well, of course, we don't live like we did 200 years ago, things have changed. Well, the ideas have also changed. If you look at especially countries with a big welfare state, uh, well, the ideas in, that, in those countries are also different, um, have also changed because of that. But because uh, uh, women are still subordinate to men in, uh, in the system, in capitalism, uh, the ideas uh, will still remain. The only way to do away with them uh, is by changing society. Um, now, a large part of feminist ideas uh, would argue the opposite. Uh, they are idealists. That is, uh, they believe that the basic uh, foundation in society are our ideas, our norms, uh, our way of life. And the way to change society is by changing how we think, changing how we act, how we look, how we dress, uh, convince others to do it, uh, who we sleep with, uh, and then um, reality will change, oppression uh, will disappear. Uh, in some senses, capitalism has alleviated somewhat the pressure uh, on women, but in other senses, it has uh, doubled it, and especially also on, on other uh, oppressed groups in <coughs> capitalism. Uh, now, this is something because uh, ca capitalism has simplified class uh, relations, uh, where increasingly two uh, groups are, are becoming more and more distinct, where you have the bourgeoisie on the one hand and the working class on the other hand. Uh, with the development of capitalism, uh, the economy has become increasingly concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, which means the bourgeoisie, uh, the real ones who dominate uh, society, uh, are fewer and fewer people, whereas the working class expands more and more. Uh, bigger parts of, of uh, the middle layers are coming closer and closer and a part of, of, uh, of the working class. And this means that the working class is the most powerful exploited class uh, in history. Uh, and this also means uh, that the bourgeoisie needs to uh, divide and rule in order to, to stay uh, uh, in their position. Uh, and as we talked about yesterday uh, on the national question, Capitalism uses every and single division it can uh, in order to exploit the working class as much as possible, uh, but also to uh, stop uh, a unified uh, resistance against uh, capitalism. And it doesn't just use all these bigger oppressions like racism, uh, women's oppression, uh, but any little division that it can. Capitalism is an extremely oppressive society uh, where all people are divided into better people, uh, worse people. Uh, an old person is, is considered uh, to be um, worse than a younger person and so on. So all are divided into better or worse people. Um, all kinds of uh, divisions exist within capitalism, and it uses this to exploit the working class as much as possible. And at times, uh, the bourgeoisie uh, will, they will lean on different parts of the working class. Sometimes they will lean on more privileged parts of the working class, uh, strengthen their prejudice, uh, maybe give some concessions to them uh, in order to strike on more oppressed parts of the working class, uh, like black people, women, uh, disabled, gay. Um, but sometimes they will also base themselves on the more oppressed uh, people by giving them some concessions, uh, doing some sim symbolic gestures, like having a black president, having a female leader, 
uh, having uh, a party leader who calls herself a feminist, um, and then in the name of feminism, attack brutally the working class. Um, and uh, through this, they balance uh, and divide uh, the working class uh, as much as possible. And they have done uh, both uh, and continue to do both. So, uh, But most concessions, uh, both minor and, and bigger ones, uh, have not happened um, by accident. Uh, the bourgeoisie do not want to give any concessions unless they have to. Um, and so most big concessions have been won through struggle. And although feminists would like to say that um, women's struggle is not connected to class struggle, um, as many other groups uh, would have it as well, that uh, the black struggle is not related to, to class struggle. Um, the gay struggle is not related to, to class struggle. History uh, says uh, differently. Uh, most big concessions for, for women have been made in revolutionary periods uh, and are a di direct consequence of, of class struggle. Um, most uh, big concessions like suffrage, uh, for example, was one uh, in the period following the First World War as a threat uh, of the Russian Revolution spreading to other countries and heightened an intense class struggle in many countries. Uh, many concessions were also made during the period in the 60s and the 70s, also as a consequence of intense radicalization uh, of class struggle um, and of revolutions in, in some countries. Um, but the struggle uh, in the 60s and the 70s, they took on a slightly different form uh, than uh, the struggles after the First World War. Um, because of the extreme degeneration of the social democratic and socialist parties and the Stalinist uh, degeneration of the communist parties. Um, although the social democratic parties had uh, degenerated into reformism um, during, uh, well, before uh, the uh, Second World World War, uh, it still had uh, a closer connection to the working class uh, and therefore uh, it could channel bigger parts of the struggle. Uh, more people were looking towards them um, at that time. But also, and especially, uh, the founding of the Communist International, uh, the creating of big communist parties, um, which of course were dominated by, by very young uh, and inexperienced communists, who made a lot of mistakes, uh, had a lot of uh, wrong ideas. Uh, but to many people, they were seen as revolutionary parties and they were moving in that direction um, and so a lot of pressed people uh, who were looking for a way out of capitalism were looking towards uh, the communist parties but in the 60s and the 70s uh, this had changed because of the Stalinist uh, degeneration and the reformist degeneration which meant that the social democratic parties the socialist parties um, adapted more and more to the bourgeoisie um, and not just adapted to, to the more liberal ideas um, and liberal methods of the bourgeoisie, but also reactionary ones. And because they ha were defending uh, the capitalist system, they also balanced on different parts of the working class, um, allowing for concessions for the more privileged part of the working class, but also giving in to their prejudice and saying, well, women belong in the home anyway. You don't really need reforms for women right now. Um, and also uh, having a quite a racist uh, tone uh, uh, many times. Um, and so they could not uh, channel uh, the struggle uh, of these oppressed uh, groups as much as they had done in the past. Um, and the Stalinist parties, because of the degeneration of the Soviet Union, uh, the Communist International um, was transformed from revolutionary parties to uh, a tool for the bureaucracy in the Soviet Union. And because the Soviet Union could not socialize uh, uh, reproduction, socialize the household work altogether, um, because it was isolated, um, it turned back, actually, a lot of the gains that were made in the beginning of the revolution um, 
and reintroduced um, the ban of abortion um, and uh, laws against homosexuality um, and started basing itself more and more on uh, on the bourgeois family um, and giving into a lot of reactionary features of, of brought back a lot of reactionary features of, of capitalism. And so a lot of Stalinist parties uh, were had quite reactionary ideas. Many saw homosexuality as uh, as a disease. Um, and because of their uh, fear of revolution, they turned Marxism uh, into a lifeless scheme uh, where socialism would happen sooner or later anyway. Um, it was the natural development after capitalism. And so revolution, well, it's... Mm, it's, it's a mechanical process. Uh, we don't really need to struggle. Um, and so all excuses possible were made uh, to take out the revolutionary features uh, of, of Marxism. Um, and it was precisely made into uh, to this mechanical uh, method, uh, which many uh, feminists accuse Marxism of having. And this is important because most feminist theoreticians, uh, which are prominent today, uh, they came into contact with Marxism precisely in the form of Stalinism. And this is the view of Marxism, which a lot of people have, uh, have gotten because of that. But what this meant also, um, as we <coughs> talked about yesterday, um, uh, as Jerome explained about France in 1968, uh, during the post-war period, um, a lot of concessions were made uh, to the working class, but this was mainly for the more privileged parts. Other parts had to wait a long time for, for any reforms, and some were treated more or less like parasites, like uh, gay people who had to hide um, and stay more or less underground, um, or be very, very secretive about, about their sexuality. And so this caused enormous frustration uh, and rage against uh, the more oppressed, uh, oppressed layers of, of uh, the working class and uh, began a process of, of radicalization, which later on spread to the working class. Um, but you saw the, uh, the outbreak of, uh, of the black struggle uh, in the US, the struggle against the Vietnam War, uh, women's struggle with women's organizations being formed in country after country, uh, and the gay struggle, uh, which mainly erupted after, uh, after the Stonewall uh, riot uh, in New York. But it was not channeled in the way it used to uh, through the <coughs> labor movement and through the communist parties. Uh, because uh, they were uh, quite reactionary. And so instead, uh, women draw the conclusion uh, that, okay, maybe we need to struggle for socialism, um, but uh, the Soviet Union clearly has not given women uh, their freedom. It has not given freedom to, to uh, gay men. Um, and in our organizations, we are treated as good coffee makers, but nothing more. Uh, and so their conclusion was we need to have separate organizations and a separate struggle and socialism will not guarantee our freedom. Um, and so you saw the emergence of separatist groups. Uh, you had gay groups, you had uh, women's groups, you had um, black uh, women's groups, you had black lesbian women's groups and all parts of very specific organizations only directed towards a certain specific oppression um, because no way out of a, of a unified struggle was, was offered by, by the labor movement. Um, and although a lot of uh, the women um, and people who were active in these movements um, saw themselves as, as revolutionary, as some of them saw themselves as Marxist, they did not have a Marxist understanding of why these oppressions exist. They did not understand the material basis uh, for them in capitalism, and therefore they did not understand how to fight it. Um, and a lot of them were um, dominated by, uh, by middle-class people, petty bourgeois people, uh, but to a certain extent, um, 
a lot of working, uh, working class people were looking uh, to some of these organizations uh, and therefore they were also radicalized during uh, this period. <coughs> but uh, after the defeat of, of the re revolutionary wave, uh, with the reaction uh, in the 80s, um, all of the, the, or many of the working class people who were present in the USA organization, uh, working class gay people, transgender and so on, ceased to be politically active or became more and more, more inactive. Uh, and the petty bourgeois tendencies in these organizations increased. Uh, many of them started looking for ways to just become accepted within capitalism uh, and limit their struggle uh, to the extreme, and they became extremely conservative and, and inward-looking. <coughs> uh, many leaders of the gay movement uh, wanted to limit the struggle to only struggle for equal uh, equality uh, in the law um, and becoming uh, a new form of accepted nuclear family. Um, but this also excluded a lot of people who uh, could not pose as a new nuclear family, uh, like transgender people, uh, and who could not accept just struggling for some kind of accepted form of, of oppression, but who clearly saw that all of this is, uh, is oppression. Uh, the society we live in is extremely uh, oppressive. And so they reacted uh, against the limitations uh, and the development in the gay movement, but also in the women's movement. Uh, and through this, uh, queer feminism uh, and intersectionality was born. Um, and although queer uh, came as a reaction against the divisions in uh, uh, the gay movement uh, and the women's movement, uh, it wanted to unify the struggle and radicalize it. Queer feminism cannot unify, uh, it cannot um, radicalize anything. Precisely because although it claims to do away with identity politics, it claims to do away with categorizing of people, um, it does not focus on what unifies us, but precisely what, what separates us. Um, so instead of uh, unifying, uh, they actually cause more divisions by categorizing people more and more. They say, oh, well, it, not everyone feel uh, oppressed in the same way that a w middle class white woman would in the US. Um, but through this, they only create new categories. Um, but no matter how many letters, no matter how many categories you create, uh, you will never be able uh, to fit in all of humanity in those categories. Uh, no matter how many letters you want to add to LBGTQ, uh, you will never fit in everyone. Um, because people are not letters, people are not small boxes, people are not small categories. Um, we are a lot more diverse than that. Um, but this is because queer feminism um, comes from the tradition uh, of, uh, of radical feminism, which precisely separates oppression, um, and intersectionality does the same thing. It separates the oppression from capitalism. Um, it does not see the root cause uh, for it in capitalism. Radical feminism thinks that women's oppression uh, has its base in, uh, in patriarchy, which is a completely different society, a completely different structure from capitalism. Um, and queer uh, does not see the basis for oppression in capitalism, but in the ideas, uh, in the norms uh, in society. Um, so women are oppressed by the idea of how a woman uh, should be. Uh, gay people are oppressed by the idea of how uh, gay people should be. Uh, and therefore, we just need to struggle uh, against the ideas, uh, against the norms, as they say, uh, and change how we live uh, and convince others to change how they live and then we will change society. Um, but through not placing the blame on capitalism, um, they place the blame on all those who are not oppressed. So white people, um, men, um, heterosexual, uh, non-transgender, 
they are the oppressors, not the bourgeoisie, uh, not capitalism, uh, but all those who are not oppressed. Um, and so in this, you actually start seeing the working class and the majority of the working class as the main enemy um, instead of an ally. Uh, and of course, um, we do not pander into the prejudice of, of the working class. We struggle against it. Um, but we do not, as queer feminists and uh, many uh, who are um, into intersectionality, um, we do not attack everyone who are privileged or uh, who have prejudice. Uh, we do not violently shout at people who, do, uh, who disagrees with us, but we patiently explain the need for a unified struggle against all oppressions um, and that the only one who have to gain by oppressions is the bourgeoisie and no one else. Um, but both intersectionality uh, and queer feminism um, precisely does not place the blame uh, on capitalism, but on, uh, on the individuals. And because of this, both play a role of dividing the movement and of dividing the working class. And therefore, it actually strengthens and helps the bourgeoisie uh, and, and reaction. The working class does not need separate organizations, but a unified organization that can represent all oppressed people in the common struggle for socialism. Uh, but for intersectionality also, uh, the working class, uh, oppression of, of the working class, is just another of many oppressions um, which are equally uh, important uh, to People who are into intersectionality, you cannot say that anything, any oppression is more fundamental than the other. Uh, but the working class is not just oppressed, uh, but exploited uh, in capitalism. Um, and we do not say that the working class has to lead the revolution, because we believe uh, that the working class suffers from uh, a more terrible, uh, worse uh, oppression than other people do. We do not say the working class has to lead the struggle because we love the working class more so than other groups. Uh, we do not say so because we think the working class is smarter or better or that we emotionally are more upset by the class oppression. Uh, but this is how many feminists tend to treat Marxism as if it's a moral question of what we like and what we dislike. Um, uh, and what we see as fundamentals as individuals. Uh, but what we see as fundamental is not what we think, but what is fundamental to capitalism. And the most fundamental thing for capitalism is the exploitation of the working class. <laughs> the main motive uh, for capitalism is the drive to make bigger and bigger profits. And in this, they need to buy the labor power uh, of the working class in order to produce uh, surplus value. Um, and this is the main motive force. And of course, other uh, oppressions are important, like I explained, the bourgeois family unit and, and women's oppression. Uh, they are also important for capitalism, but it is not the main, uh, the main uh, exploitation. It's not the main fundamental thing for it. Um, and the working class, precisely because of its uh, fundamental role, because of its role in production, uh, has a power, uh, a potential power, uh, of hitting capitalism where it hurts. By striking, they threaten uh, the profits. And in case of a general strike, uh, the whole society comes to a standstill. Um, other oppressed groups do not have uh, this kind of power. Women as a group uh, do not have that kind of power. Um, immigrants as a group, separate group from, from the working class, do not possess that power. They possess that power as a part of the working class. Um, and because of the working class uh, position in production, it also has the potential not just of overthrowing capitalism, but of forming a new society, which can be seen in each and every revolution, 
where uh, an embryo of a worker state is born, uh, where workers move to take over the factories uh, and parts of the society and start running it themselves. Um, and this is why uh, we talk about the role of the working class uh, and the need for the working class to lead, uh, lead the struggle. And of course, many of these oppressed uh, groups uh, play a very important key role as a part of the working class, but not as, uh, as a separate part from it. Um, now, in normal times, um, the working class is divided uh, because in order to survive, one has to think uh, about oneself first and foremost. Uh, you have to think about your own family first and foremost. And if a way out is not offered, uh, if a way out to be uh, and a possibility of being uh, solidarity with uh, sharing solidarity with others, uh, you will start thinking uh, about uh, others. And the bourgeoisie will be able to divide uh, and use the divisions within the working class. Some people will vote for, for right-wing racist parties, not because the majority are very racist uh, and think that people should be sent back to death and that they deserve to die, uh, but because they think, well, there is a limited amount of jobs. Uh, uh, all the politicians who claim otherwise uh, are clearly lying. Uh, and so, therefore, my group, uh, my family, should come first because we were born here. Uh, and other people will think, uh, well, the working class is clearly, uh, or the white working class is clearly, or the heterosexual working class is clearly uh, oppressing me every day. Why should I trust them? Why should I unite with them? I'll join my own organization and carry on my own struggle. This is normal in, uh, in times when, when there is not any class struggle uh, or any revolution. But this changes uh, in revolutionary periods. Um, and a lot of people on the left are very skeptical about what a revolution can do. Um, this is precisely because they see a revolution as a purely economical process where the mode of production is changed into another mode of production. Um, but the revolution is not just an economical process. It is the process where millions of people uh, come onto the streets and for the first time in their life are able to breathe, are able to express their grievances, uh, all the things that they have uh, forced, have been forced to shut up about all their lives, uh, and millions of people who are treated every day like parasites, who are told that they are stupid, uh, that they can blame themselves for their oppression. All those people feel all of a sudden uh, that enough is enough, uh, and they say uh, no to all of those oppressions and start moving against it. And through that, millions of people start having self-respect, start being able to look at themselves in the mirror. Um, but it's not just the process where one begins to respect uh, oneself. It is mainly the process where the working class begins to realize uh, its role in society and its enormous strength. And that strength comes through unity. Uh, it realized the need for absolute unity over uh, all uh, divides um, to, to counter all the divisions within the working class. It needs uh, the biggest possible uh, unity. And so all those who are not changed uh, in a revolution, who continue to have a lot of prejudice, um, are forced to shut up because they will lose uh, if, uh, if the struggle is not united. But at the same time, uh, many people do change because it is, becomes increasingly difficult to oppress your woman when she is out fighting with the police, when she went on strike long before you did. It is increasingly difficult to uh, have racist prejudice against your uh, immigrant colleague when he saves your life on the street. It becomes increasingly difficult uh, to uh, disrespect your gay son when he and his colleagues uh, uh, take over uh, the factory 
and start running it themselves. So a lot of people experience uh, a revolution in their minds. Uh, they change into their opposites and, and begin question a lot of these ideas that they had before. So it's not just an economical process. Uh, it's also uh, a revolution of, of emotions uh, and ideas uh, of culture. Of course, uh, a revolution, uh, if it does not succeed, uh, all goes back to, to, or more or less, to uh, the way it was before. Um, but uh, if it does succeed, that does not mean that all is well uh, and that all oppression ha uh, oppressions have been swept aside. Um, we are not uh, like the anarchists who claim that once we sweep aside uh, capitalism, the state is gone, uh, all is gone, and we live perfectly, happily, uh, uh, equally, all together, the day after the revolution. Uh, we understand that it will take time. Um, uh, not all will be, uh, be gone after the revolution, but the material basis uh, for uh, the oppression uh, will be gone, uh, and therefore the ideas will not continue to, to reproduce. But it will take time. Um, now, a revolution breaks out uh, sooner or later, uh, but it does not succeed uh, uh, automatically. Um, as we have seen time and time again, most strikes uh, do not succeed. Uh, and most revolutions have uh, failed, uh, precisely because millions of people uh, during a short space uh, of a revolution cannot understand everything uh, that you need to understand in order to take power. Um, it needs a mass revolutionary party uh, in order to do so. It needs that a section of the working class uh, has prepared in advance for the revolution by studying Marxism, by studying how capitalism works and how you struggle against it, have learned the experience from, from previous revolutions and, and know how to take power. And that mass revolutionary party cannot be divided uh, into uh, just for gay people or just for women. It needs to represent everyone uh, of, uh, of the working class and struggle against uh, all oppressions. Um, now, I don't really have time to, to talk about uh, the question of reforms. I think we can deal with that in the uh, discussion. But just something uh, uh, on it. Um, it is portrayed uh, often uh, as uh, feminists are the ones who are struggling now uh, against women's oppression. Um, and Marxists are the ones who sit on the couch and wait uh, for the revolution. Um, but if you look uh, in reality uh, on how uh, petty bourgeois feminist leaders uh, like the feminist party uh, that was just created in Sweden, for example, or a few years ago, uh, if you look at uh, leaders in the labor movement uh, who claim to be uh, feminists, or if you just look at the, the petty uh, bourgeois feminist organizations, um, you see that time and time again, uh, they uh, fail uh, to propose, uh, to carry through uh, what they have suggested to do, and they limit their demands to sounding as uh, unradical, as conservative as possible. Um, and uh, if you look at feminism uh, in the third world countries, um, they play an openly reactionary role uh, in the NGOs, uh, where uh, they don't really do anything uh, for women. Uh, they hold very nice conferences, eat very, very nice foods, hold very nice positions, um, but they don't really do anything real for women, uh, or actually they do something um, which is corruption. Um, they take women out from the struggle, uh, they look for, oh, very nice old leftists, pull them away from the struggle, corrupt them and turn them into the same thing uh, that they are, which is nothing more uh, than a way to uh, take the struggle and turn it into uh, safe channels for, for capitalism. And so it's not really Marxists who do not care about women's oppression or who do not struggle against it. 
we struggle for each and every single reform uh, that we can, but we do not have any illusions uh, that a single reform will, will change anything uh, fundamentally. Um, and we connect all uh, the struggle for the reforms to the uh, abolishment of, of capitalism. Um, and we are really uh, the only ones who will not uh, give up. And although I would say the majority of people who say uh, that they are feminists um, are uh, hardcore fighters uh, and want to struggle for total equality for everything, uh, for everyone. Um, feminism as uh, an ideology, whether it is radical feminism or uh, whatever form, uh, cannot be used as a tool to fight women's oppression. Um, precisely because it's time and time again has been used to divide the working class on secondary uh, lines. Marxism is the only uh, ideology that can represent the whole of the working class. Um, and our ideas uh, will be proven uh, correct uh, in the struggle. Uh, and their ideas will be proven incorrect uh, in the struggle. Um, and so I think we need to time and time uh, remind ourselves and study uh, history and see uh, what the effects of, of feminism has been uh, and how working class women uh, have struggled uh, to learn uh, and to know uh, that we are correct uh, and to hold on to uh, revolutionary optimism which is needed, uh, and in the time of, uh, in the face of reaction, uh, not be, um, not adapt to the pessimism uh, which dominates uh, a large part of the left, but uh, hold on to uh, the revolutionary optimism uh, which uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, explained uh, in the last article uh, which she wrote before she was murdered, that uh, the bourgeoisie uh, are not stable. Capitalism uh, is not stable. Uh, reaction is not solid. Um, she said that your order is built on sand. Uh, tomorrow the revolution will raise itself once again and with a rattle uh, declare with fanfare uh, to your terror. Uh, I was, I am, I will be. And we will.